We left off on the tafsir. We didn't finish the last ayah. So from there, inshallah, we will begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa la aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Wa la udwana illa ala al-zalimeen. Wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Uswatina wa kutubatina. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. وعلى كل من استن بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد. All praises due to Allah, the Lord of all that which exists. Verily, the a good ending is always with the for the people of Taqwa. The good ending, the good ending is for the people of Taqwa, and there is no transgression and wrongdoing except against the oppressors and wrongdoers themselves. And may the praise, peace, and blessings of Allah be upon our noble Prophet Muhammad. Our excellent example with whom we follow and upon his family and all his companions and everyone who clings to his traditions to the day of judgment. I mean, as for what follows, um, inshallah ta'ala, we was in Surah to kahf I mean, Surah to um, Takafur, which means what? Mutually piling up. That's right. To mutually pile up of what? Unnecessary things. Unnecessary things of the dunya. Okay, it's, it's not just unnecessary things. See, I'm going to get everybody involved before we move on. Make sure we re, we recapping. Unnecessary is it always unnecessary things of the dunya? Is he says it's everything. Things that can distract you from having being mindful of Allah. Okay, that sounds better. Things that distract you from being mindful of Allah. That can be good or bad things. That could be good or bad bad things. As an example of a good thing, لو كنت, if you was تقرأ القرآن, you was reading the Quran, and Salatul Fajr comes in, and you keep reading the Quran till Salatul Fajr go out, can this become takathur? Yeah. Yes, it can become takathur. Mutually, so it's that which forgets you, causes you to leave off your obligations. Exactly, being excessive is an example of that So This is a very important point That we have to understand Takatho is a, The ayat in his also is referring to That which is of the dunya that distract you Because it wouldn't behoove anyone with their, Who normal intelligence would allow Worship To hinder them A voluntary worship To hinder them from an obligatory worship Of course But that happens unfortunately so even that which has been legend, like you'll find an example, an individual will stand up and he prays to Hajjud. He's consistent with the Hajjud. But he never, when he go, he lays down an hour before, half an hour before to Fajr. And he sleeps all through Fajr. Then now he's leaving off an obligation and he's persistent in a voluntary worship. That thing has become a distraction for him. And he has to leave that off if it's going to make him leave off his obligation to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. So is that which distract you Aslam from what is obligatory from you? As we have cut as um what we didn't mention in uh, this particular tafsir, but al hakum from the word al ha that which distract you, that which occupy you, at Takatha from the mutual piling up of worldly things, Yani uh it means it changed you it it changed you from what's obligatory to amusement. Generally, it changed you to what's amusement. Wallahu, amusement is al insiraf ilma ma yadru il al hawa ilayhi al hawa. It is turning away from. It is that which turn you away from what your obligations are and invites you to some desire. This is what generally what takathur is. But can fall into this category those things that is mustahabbat. Either kuddimat ala fardiyat. That it can be connected also to it, those things that's praiseworthy to do in Islam. If it makes you, if you put it before, what is obligatory? If you put it before, what is obligatory? So, but the also the origin of taha al hakum al takathur is that which distract you. So, so that's why the ulama say, al-hakum, that which distract you. 
The Yanni is Takathur. From the mutual piling of the worldly life. They say, and sap from those things make you be forgetful. Or it busies you so much, you fall short. You fall short. An ta'atillahi rabbikum. From the obedience of Allah your Lord. Wa tafakhurukum bil mal. And the boastfulness that comes with wealth. Wal walad and children. Wa tabahikum bi kathrati dharika. And you keep boasting and being proudful to the point you gather these things in abundance to the distract you away from the obedience of Allah. The obedience of Allah to Barak wa Ta'ala. And also the origin of obedience to Allah is ma furida alayna. Is that which has been made obligatory upon us. Is firstly that which has been made obligatory upon us. Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says مَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبَدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا فَتَرَدْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ That my slave cannot get any nearer to me. This is Allah Ta'ala talking. My servant cannot get any closer to me, any nearer to me, except with that which I have made obligatory upon him. Except with that which I have. So that comes first. So obedience of Allah is referring to that and then those things that are voluntarily Aspects of worship But the Shaykh Or oh Allah Ta'ala He mentions this He says these things distract you Until you visit the graves And this is referring to the Barzakh As we mentioned before And the Barzakh Is ma bayna hadhi al-hayat dunya wal akhirah Is that which is between this life And the hereafter It's the manazil It's the first levels towards the hereafter As we mentioned before Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu That he used to cry whenever he heard anything mentioned about the barzakh or the grave He would cry But he would not cry if he heard about the hellfire and its horrors It wouldn't affect him like that Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar It's my man Anyway, I'm sorry, I just got distracted um, But uh, These particular Things here, the grave is a visiting place. It's not a permanent place. It's not a permanent place for us. It's a place for us where we're going to have a window to where we're going to. To be constantly reminded. For however long that period of time will be in for us inside of the barzakh. We will have a doorway and the fragrances will be coming from that place we're going to. Whether that be the funky horrors of the hellfire and bad smells that come out of it, or whether that be the blissfulness of paradise and the beautiful smells that come from it, will be with us in the barzakh various forms of punishments and rewards based upon what you do now. So that's a visiting period. And you're visiting. You're either going to be blissful or it's going to be sad and punishable. And that's why Uthman ibn Affan used to cry when he heard the grave. Because when he was questioned, why? He said, He said, because that's the first stages to the hereafter. That whoever is safe, finds safety and security in the grave. That which is after is going to be more safety, more secure. It's going to, so it's a guarantee. If we make it there. But if you fell there, you will more than likely fell in the hereafter. And um, so these are some of the things. All right, here go another question. One question that we covered so far in this area. What did we mention in the barzakh, in the grave, the place that we were going to visit? What's the difference between punishments there and punishments in the hereafter? What's the difference that we mentioned? Ah, caught up with that one, didn't I? One is temporary. No, that's, I ain't say that, but that's true. One is temporary. And if, well, for the believers, even in the hereafter, if we're going to be punished, we died upon Tohi, it's temporary. So, so much so the scholars differ. Will we be in the same hellfire that the Kufar will be in? Scholars differ about that. They say it's a different pu punishment for us. Some scholars take that mocha with Adilla, with evidence. And some scholars say, no, it's the same hellfire. And they got their evidence. So either way, for the believers, the punishment in the hellfire 
or the grave is temporary. So that's the same. I'm now I'm asking, what's the difference we mentioned between punishment in the grave and punishment in the hereafter that we mentioned? There's a lot, but that we mentioned. Bismillah. Punishment in grave, punishment in hereafter. Yes, yeah, I caught you with that one. He wasn't ready for that one. I mentioned this a couple class ago. I yes. believe we mentioned that matters be rectified in the um. Matters be rectified amongst the believers. No. And differences will be dealt with in the Barzakh. No, that's in the hereafter. No, nope, that's not in the Barzakh. No. Nope. Come on, brothers. <laughs> Nobody got an answer. At me. <laughs> Sheikh at me. Come on, Sheikh at me. You remember? I had mentioned that Sheikh Tala Zahran, I'm going to mention the Sheikh we got this from, who's a student of Uthameen and Bin Baz. That's his mashayikh and others, but those his main mashayikh. He studied, he studied four years with Sheikh Bin Baz and four years with Sheikh Earth Amin. And he's in Alexandria, your town, Amin, Alex, Alexandria. And he said to us that in the Barzakh is guaranteed punishment if you die upon a major sin that you didn't repent for. This is what I told you. If you commit a major sin, lo. Uh, that if you committed a major sin mm-hmm. You died upon it without repentance Is guaranteed punishment in the barzakh In the barzakh But that is not the case On the day of judgment On the day of judgment The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said And Allah mentions the Quran too, but the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Insha'a ghafara wa insha'a azaba. That if Allah want, to about relating to the believers, He will punish, or if He want, He will forgive. If He want, He will punish, or if He want, He will forgive. That's referring to the hereafter, but in the grave, guaranteed punishment. And He uses evidence for that, is the famous hadith of Sahih Bukhari of the two companions of the Prophet being punished in their graves. This is what we mentioned. The two companions of the Prophet that's being punished in their graves. And these are Sahabi Jalil. Sahabiani Jalilani. Two righteous companions of the Prophet. They were being punished in the grave, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. And he tried to lighten their punishment in the grave. But in the Jannah hereafter, they go going to Jannah. They're going to Jannah. Because Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fatih, Allah says, And every single one of the companions, Allah promised paradise. Every single one of them. So this is one of the adilla that the evidences that the earlier mentioned. Naam, young man. Bismillah. Major sins, not. Mm-hmm. I said in the barzakh you're punished for guaranteed to be punished for major sins. And in the hereafter, which is after the barzakh, after we visit the barzakh, if Allah wants, he will punish, and if he wants, he will forgive. And it's going to be based on your, that will be based on your tawheed, how firm it is in your chest. It will affect that. It will affect that. So this is very important that we learn about these aspects of our belief as Muslims. Because this is the very thing that the kuffar, as Sheikh Uthameen mentions in his Riyadh al-Salihin in other book, his explanation of Riyadh al-Salihin, is the kuffar don't care what you wear and what your children, how they look. What they're more concerned about is tasbibu al-shak fi ma huwa wajibun imanu bihi bidurura. He said that they have no care of you, what your children wear and how they look. What they're concerned is causing doubt. In those areas of the deen, is not allowed to have doubt. That if you have doubt in it, you will go to the hellfire. You are kufi or kafir if you have doubt about it. They will cause doubt. This is why, as I was saying to a brother earlier today, it's so important when it comes to our children mm-hmm. that we teach them this aqidah, especially the bab of wala wal bara, especially the door subject matter of what it means to be loyal to Islam and the Muslims and what it means to be disloyal to kufr and the disbelievers. And then one of the best books that's available that explains that is Thalatha to Usul, The Three Fundamental Principles. That book covered that subject matter very, very well. I don't care who Sheikh 
explanation you use from the scholars of Ahl Sunnah, even though I incline towards Earth A means explanation, and then also Sheikh Al Qasimi. I don't know what cable, how they have his cover anymore, but they used to have three fingers being held up like this in his Qasimi's translation. He covers it even better than Earth A mean, I believe. But that's something, but this is something that's very important because that's the, one of the biggest problems for the men, women, and children of this ummah in the West. Is that is our it's translated? Is our love, but they might have changed the cover because I'm going on translation. It's been translated a long time ago. This is when the original cover used to have a hand holding up three fingers, like that, rep, rep meaning the three principles. So I don't know if it's still that one is still available, or if they mean it's definitely available. And his is excellent. This subject matter that most Muslims don't know about. For that book covers who's allowed to come and live in the land of kufr, and who's not allowed. And why they not allowed? And what are the conditions for being here? Very excellent book, mashallah. But most Muslims don't know this book. And they need to be familiar because it defines what it means to be loyal to Islam and the Muslims. And what it means to have disloyalty to kufr and the disbelievers. And we have more need of that than the Muslims do in the lands of the Muslims. Because we live amongst kufar. We live amongst kufar. And the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hated that our lifestyles be seen. What was the other Sheikh name? Uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Qasimi. I forgot his full name. Sheikh, uh, I forgot his full name right this moment. But I know it's Sheikh Al Qasimi. He's from Saudi Arabia too. He was before the means time. I remember during the time of his, his Sheikh's um, uh, Saudi's time. So from there, this is issue is important for us to understand. We kind of veered off, but we're talking about the Barzakh. The Barzakh. You find this is connected to belief in Yom al Akhir, belief in the Day of Judgment, and what will take place. And the first levels is that. And we should be prolific in knowing this subject matter. We should know them very well generally. Mujmalatan. The all the Ummah of Muhammad. And the scholars of Islam and the students of knowledge, they should know these areas in detail. You, should, you cannot claim. Talib, Talib al -im being a student of knowledge and not know this, these subject matters, inside and out. It's obligatory because we are responsible for conveying it to the people. And if we don't know it, that means we're doubt. With that, what you don't know, you're doubtful about. And shaitan can play with. And that's what he likes to play with. That which we are not knowledgeable of. Because when Allah Ta'ala's messenger says, Al halal al bayyin wal haram al bayyin wa baynahuma. That the halal is clear with its is clear with its evidence and the haram is clear with its evidence. And between that are affairs that resemble the halal and the haram. Or a doubtful matters we like to translate it sometimes as. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this hadith it become clear. What he says after that, He said, many of the people don't know what they are, the doubtful matters. But people who have knowledge understand. So a person like a student of knowledge and a scholar, what may be doubtful for the rest of the people may not be doubtful for him. That's why he has to be cautious about the things he may even do if for the regular people it may be a doubtful matter. It may be a doubtful matter. And they see him doing it, say, although he practices that was doubtful. But for him it's not doubtful because of the level of knowledge he has. But he has to be cautious not to give bad da'wah. And that's always put in the forefront because Jalb al Musalih Muqaddam ala Defr al Mudar Muqaddam ala Jalb al Musalih. Doing that which is tracking what is good is all, I mean, propelling what is harmful has precedence over doing what is good, attracting to do that which is good. Because if I'm going to do something good that's going to mislead some other people, I should leave that good. Even though that's allowed for me, I should leave it. And this is very important for us to understand that in relation to this area, we should not have no doubt whatsoever. You brothers and sisters in Islam should know your belief in Yom Al-Akhir, generally all the subject matters. You should generally know it. Barakallahu fiku. And you should study them and read them until it causes change and effect in your everyday life. Barakallahu fiku. And from there, the Shaykh Hafizahullah. He mentions Allah Hatta Zurtumul Makabah until you visit the graves. We're recapping still. Meaning, 
hatta, some scholars say, hatta mutum, until you die. That's what they say that means, until you visit the grave. Meaning until you die, you visit the grave. Wa sirtum ila al-muqabir, and you travel in journey to the grave. Zuwara, as visitors, in the state of visitation. Because that's hal. Thumma tukhrajun, and then you will be taken out. So, being distracted by the takathur, meaning tafakhur, or mufakhara, those things that we take pride in, and we boast about in this life, from women and children and wealth. And we mentioned that Allah Ta'ala, He disdained this, it's a kalla, which is zajr with tambih, as we said to the Abu Amin last week, that when Allah says kalla, which we translate oftentimes to mean nay, but the term is used, to reprimand and bring attention to what? Sofa ta'limun. You shall come to know. Miyani, ma yakunu min al adabi fil qabr. You will soon come to know what will occur of punishment in the grave. Was tamarrat ishtigalukum bima al haqum min takathurikum fi anwalikum awladikum ila an sirtum. That you will continue to allow to occupy you and busy you that. Which distract you from the piling up of your piling up of the of wealth and children until the point and sirtum you become suddenly il al maqabir in in ending up in the graveyard. It just happened to you suddenly. What do fintum fiha? You buried in it. What have you made? How can they embury and you'll he he akum at the kathuru bil awa? He said it is not suitable. It is not suitable that distract you piling up of the wealth of this worldly life until death do you part. That's not. And this is important for us as Muslims. Because the question comes, okay, so if it's not supposed to distract us, the first question going to come, all right, when I'm going to go to the grave? That's the point. You don't know. So you ain't never supposed to allow these things to distract you. You give it its proper place in your life. Like many of the Salaf, they had no attachment to their world life, even if they was wealthy. We got so many narrations. If stuff was doubtful, they would lose mounts, mountains of money because it was doubt in it. Because their main concern was always the hereafter. They did not allow worldly gains to distract them from their obligations to Allah. They did not allow it from them to distract them and busy them away from the obedience of Allah wa ta'ala. So Allah is reminding us of this reality. He says, and then he repeats it, ثُمَّ كَلَّ سَوْفَ تَعْمَنْ Then again, nay, you shall come to know. And the first one was talk about the punishment in the grave. The second one is the punishment in the hereafter. When Allah says it a second time. Because he says, "Thumma kella sabatamo." Scholar said, "Ma yakunu min aadabi fil akhirah." What will occur? Punishment in the hereafter. So the one one is the first one is talking about the punishments, the chastisements that would you, you will come to see that will occur in the grave. Then that you're going to be visitors. We are going to be visitors. Then you won't come to see the punishments that will occur in the hereafter. And also the scholars say the meaning is Sofa tatabayanuna anna dar al akhirata khayrun lakum. And you will definitely become clear to you without a shadow of a doubt that the abode of the hereafter is better for you. But it's too late at that point. But wallahi, how can we have this consciousness reading the Quran, reading the hadith of the Messenger of Allah? That brings you to that fruition and check them, put you in your place. MashaAllah. Kalla law ta'ala muna ilma laqeen. Then Allah continues, nay, you shall know with knowledge of certainty. And we explain what knowledge of certainty is. That's you, you knowing something, having information. Like I gave the example of the steak sandwich, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Philly steak sandwich I was going to give you. You know, I was going, if I told you, I got you, you were confident about that. That's ilma yaqeen. That's knowledge of certainty. Mm-hmm. You're not doubting that. And that's how we are with the kitab and sunnah. Whatever the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may say, we believe it unequivocally. More than we believe what our own hands, our own lives have witnessed. And that's the highest level of iman. 
That's the Siddiqun. Like Abu Bakr reached that level. Like when the Messenger of Allah made Mi'raj to, uh, he ascended to the heavens and he made the Isra, the night journey. Isra, he made the night journey to Masjid al Aqsa. When he came back, he told that story. Everybody saw, oh, man, Muhammad lost his mind. Ain't no in the world. That man traveled in one night to Me to, from Mecca all the way to Jerusalem and back. And so Allah put in front of him. All that which he passed by, and he described it as he looking at it. They can't see it, but Allah put it in front of him. And the Messenger of Allah looking at everything that took place on that journey. He lived narrating to them so they can believe him. And then he told them, Wallahi, Abu Bakr believes me. Abu Bakr wasn't even there. He wasn't even there. But that's how strong his iman is and what comes out of the mouth of Hawa. From the one who don't speak from his own vain desires. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr wasn't there. He said, Abu Bakr believes me. And when they came to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, they said to Abu Bakr, Muhammad is going crazy. Did you hear what he said? He traveled in, in one night. And Abu Bakr, look at, his, look at his confidence in what comes off the tongue. He don't only believe it unequivocally, he immediately defended it. And he didn't even hear it yet from the Messenger of Allah. He didn't even hear this story from the prophet. He heard it from the Kufar of the Quraysh. They came to him. You believe Muhammad said this, man? He said, yeah. Revelation come to me even faster than that from the heavens to the earth. And that's even further. Allahu Akbar. This is ilm al yaqeen that reached haqq al yaqeen And that's the Siddiqeen. That's the people whose knowledge of certainty reached the highest level of certainty, which is the reality of certainty, where you feeling it and touching it and experiencing it. That's why some of the Salaf, and I mentioned this too, you can reach this level of Iman, and, I, and it blew my mind when I heard Sheikh Salih Fawzan say this, that it's possible to see Allah in your dream, if you know the names and attributes of Allah and understand them, because the Messenger of Allah saw him in a dream. He said, so it's possible for us. Likewise, it's possible for us to see the Jannah and the Hellfire in this life, in our dreams. Because it happened to many of the companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But that's when the Iman has reached high levels. And only way it reached these levels when you have this heavy attachment to the Qur'an. You're very familiar with the stories, and they become real for you, man. And this is what is connected to this issue of knowledge of certainty. For us, what the Prophet Allah and His Messenger tell us, the first level is the right, all of us know allowed to have less than knowledge of certainty. In that which we've been informed of, of the unseen. We believe it unequivocally. We don't have no doubt. Rather, we make excuses for it, even if it don't make sense. Like the sun, when it sets, it goes to prostrate in front of Allah. We try to find excuses for that, what the Messenger of Allah said. Like many of the ulama in defending the truth. That's signs of your knowledge of certainty is reaching to the next level, which is the eye of certainty, seeing and witnessing with your own eye, which I said in your dream. And then you reach the level of touching it. And this is something, Wallahi, brothers, we should strive to ask Allah to open and give us success in that. And then the Shaykh he goes on after that. He talks about the end of the surah. And then you shall truly be questioned on that day about the bliss. يعني كل ما تتلذذون به في الدنيا من الصحة والطعام والشراب وغير ذلك. And that is, you shall truly be questioned on that day about every entertainment and joy that you had in this life of good health. Of food and drink and other than that. Any form of bliss you're going to be questioned about. What will we benefit from that? I want to ask. What's the first thing coming to your mind when you hear that? Why, why is Allah telling us? What do you expect? It? What's the point of Allah telling us this? That you shall indeed be questioned about every bliss on that day. Why? What what we talk about? What do you think? Say it again. Be careful what you do. Allahu Akbar. That's what I wanted to hear. How far from a distance? That's my man. Paula says that old school talking right there, brother. Like the prophet used to say, kept biru, kept biru. Go to your elders, go to your elders. See? See? Look at that. And that's the truth. That's the point of this. That you don't 
take whatever bliss you have and use it in the haram. And that you use it in that which is pleasing to Allah. And you don't fall into excessiveness with it. You fall into wasatiya, balance, or whatever you have of bliss because you're going to be questioned about it. So be cautious. Like he just said, Hafidullah. And so this is what Allah mentioned. And this is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi one day came out very hungry. And he saw other companions and late at night had came out because they were hungry. This is when the Muslims was in Mecca. They were poor, struggling on the truth. And they went to find someone who had food and they fed them. And the Messenger of Allah quoted this ayat at the end of the enjoyment of each other's company and eating with one another. Even your company. How was you towards your brother or your sister? How was you with your wife? All of this are naive bliss that we're going to be questioned about. Arabic, I love the Arabic language. He says, and it is not suitable to be like this, to allow, to distract you, the piling up of this worldly life, wealth and children, to allow that, because even your own children can distract you. If you knew this with knowledge of certainty, with, 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 with true knowledge, I mean, you would refrain, you would rush to execute or to save yourselves from the, the, those things that can lead to your destruction from amongst the things you pile up of this life. And indeed, you will see the hellfire. And then again, you shall see it without any doubt whatsoever. And then you will be questioned on the day of judgment about all the categories of bliss, whether that be shade that you sit in or sweet water you drink or a comfortable bed that you lay on or food that is, tastes delicious or a beautiful wife. You're going to be questioned about it. This is what the sheikh says, ain't me, I'm translating. <laughs> Am I like sheikh, isn't that what he just said in Arabic? This is what the Sheikh said. I'm not trying to, I ain't bring nothing for myself just now. So, this sort of brings that reality. And Allah Ta'ala is uh, telling us not to allow that mutual empowering up of the worldly life and the boastfulness of the worldly life to distract us with the abundancy of wealth and numerous things that can distract us from the obedience of Allah and from that which will save us from His punishment. And to be toppled over with that until the point death comes to us. Allah tells us don't be distracted. Until the point you're buried into the graveyard. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatens those individuals who pile up this worldly life. With a statement, Nay, you shall come to know those people who stay still stuck on stupid. You will be reprimanded from this mutual piling up. وَكَرَّرَ هَذَا الْوَعِيدِ مُبَالَغَةً مُبَالَغَةً فِي الزَّجْرِ And Allah Ta'ala repeat this threat and being excessive in repeating that threat to bring the reprimand and the fear. And the meaning of that is سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ عَقِبَةَ تَكَثُرِكُمْ You're going to see the end result of your mutual piling up. وَتَفَخُرِكُمْ بِالْمَالِ And you're boasting with wealth. والوالد and children واشتغالكم بذلك عن الآخرة and you allowing that to occupy you from the hereafter وسوف تعلمون عقبة ذلك you shall indeed come to know the end result of that إذا نزل بكم الموت when death descends upon you وكرر الزجر في الآية and then the threat the reprimand is repeated repeats itself in the آية التالية that is recited when Allah Ta'ala says the word كلا ثم قال بعدها then Allah says after that لو تعلمون علم اليقين if only you knew this with knowledge of certainty عقبة أمركم 
What's going to be the end result of your affair? Ba'd al maut after death. La shaghalakum dharika. Truly that din for will not busy you. It will not occupy you. This is how when you read about your cellar brothers and sisters in Islam, you see ajib ul ajab. Amazing stories. How the dunya did not, I mean, it even have an idea of a distraction upon them because of this reality. Like the Sheikh is saying, Wallahi, if you knew what knowledge of certainty was in the hellfire, what's going to happen in the grave, what punishments is going to take place, how Allah is going to deal with you, that stuff wouldn't occupy in this worldly life. You will not be occupied. ثُمَّ تَوَعَدَ سُبْحَانَهُ عِبَادَهُ بِرُؤْيَةِ النَّارِ And then Allah threatens His servants with the seeing of the hellfire. فِي الْآخِرَةِ In the hereafter. بِأَوْصَارِهِمْ With their own naked eyes. ثُمَّ أَكَّدَ هَذَا الْوَعِيدُ بِالْتَقَرَارِهِ And then Allah emphasizes this threat with repeating it. مَعْطُوفٍ In the follow-up. بِثُمَّ We're using the word and then. تَغْلِيْوَ As heavily stressing. For tahdeed in the threat. So he can put fear in our heart. Allah loves us, man. Wallahi, well, he loves us. That's why he sent this Quran to us. Right, right, right. That's why that Quran, he keeps it preserved. It's in our houses. It's on everybody's shelves. It's translated and all these. Allah does this because he loves us, wallahi. But the problem is, we don't really love ourselves. We don't really love ourselves. He says, Then Allah Ta'ala says this, emphasizing, putting the stress points and magnifying, being severe in this threat and his promise, saying, You shall truly see it. He said, That seeing by itself, it is certainty. And you shall be questioned on the day of recompense. For every single thing on a day of rewarding and recompense, you shall be questioned about all the things Allah bestowed upon you there with a bounty fit dunya in this worldly life. Min ni'ami of various bounties. In spite of his numerality and his numerous facets that it come in and colors. You're gonna be questioned about all of the ones you realize and ones you don't realize. So we have no recourse but to be grateful. So now we're going to end the tafsir here. We're talking about ma yustafadu min al ayat. What we benefit from these verses. And these benefits we get from Aysar al Tafasir, Fabakba Sheikh Abu Bakr al Jazairi. His famous tafsir that the ulama praise, which is entitled Aysar al Tafasir, the most easiest interpretation. I will translate that to me. I mean, he brings various interpretations of the Quran, and then he, he made it real simple for the common Muslim. This is why his tafsir is all over the Muslim world, and all over the world. And that, in my opinion, that tafsir should have been translated a long time ago. A long time ago. It's real easy. He do vocabulary words, he give you what the words mean, and he brings lessons that you, put, you, you take from these sources, that you can walk away with, which we're about to mention eight of them. There's eight lessons Benefits we take from this surah. He says, What's the ayat in these verses? And that's very clear. In these verses is the rebuke, the rebuking upon the one who is busied with the affairs of the worldly life away from the obedience of Allah. That's a very important one. And I wanted to mention one that I see happen so often, unfortunately, with our Muslim sisters. With our Muslim sisters. And this is sad. It saddens me to the highest levels of sadness. And that is, many of the Muslim husbands are away from the homes and not around the children. Because we try to follow the statement of Allah. That the men are the custodians and maintainers of the women. Okay, because of that, especially living in New Jersey, brother man got to get out there and get that cheese. Am I correct? He got to go to work. He want to take care of that wife. He want to take care. And so therefore, he's not around the children as much as mama is. And one of the things that I find consistent with the Muslim women, and it's sad. It's sad, man. 
And that is, they do not take their boys to the masjid. Husband is at work. They think that job is just on him. It's on you and he chose you to be the mother of his children too. He met a Shafi'i who didn't have a father because he died as a little boy. She made that boy become a, one of the great imams of this time. Of his time, of all times. Forget his time, of any time. You won't be a Muslim and not know who Imam Shafi'i is. Even if you don't know his, his, who he is, you know that name. Shafi'i. Okay, you know, you heard this name before Imam Shafi'i? You heard it before, he just probably don't remember. Imam Shafi'i, because I don't quote his name in many classes. Imam Shafi'i is well known in the Ummah. His mother used to send him out to go to the classes of the scholars and push him to become a scholar of Islam. And we can't even get our Muslim sisters to get their children to Jumu'ah, to get them to the, at least one salat out the day when the husband is not home. And what kills me, the women will have their death. Oh, I'm busy. You busy? al hakamut al huh? That's all I'm going to say to that. al hakamut You let... The mutual poly of this worldly life distract you. This is what Allah is talking about. Then you don't understand when that child is a teenager, he has a baby. Or she took off her jilbab and khimar. We don't understand why. I don't understand. I had them go to a Muslim school, but what Islam you implemented in that child's life? And this be the case I see so many times with Muslim women. You got to tell them, did you take your husband? Yes, did you take them to the masjid, baby? No, I was busy. And she'd say it like that. I was busy. Like, this is okay. No, I was busy. It's okay. It's all right. I, I know Allah's mad. It's okay. It's not that important. I don't see it now. I'm distracted. It's okay. You're going to let that stuff distract you until you visit the graves, brothers and sisters in Islam? And I don't want to just dwell on the sisters. The brothers fall negligent but bringing their children to the masjid too. But I wanted to emphasize to the sisters because that's not, I don't hear see that mentioned that often. I see it so much, so much. Sister called with a question about complaining about their kids. And my first question, how do you, does you take them to you make sure you go to Juma? No, no, I don't do that. Well, does his father make sure you go to Juma? Well, his father, he's his father, Kafir. Well, sister, he has to go to Juma. That's your job. That's your responsibility. Save yourselves and your family from a hellfire. That's few by mankind and stones. Allahu Akbar. The second benefit. <laughs> In these verses is the threat and warning of gathering wealth. And making it abundant, along with it causes one to lack in showing gratitude to Allah with that wealth. And the abandonment of the obedience of Allah and His Messenger for the sake of wealth. What come first, sisters? And that killed me. I, I'd rather have. I forgot the name of the, the new beds that cost like three and four thousand, five thousand dollars. Come on, give me one. Them new beds that's out, you know, and then they roll up, like if it, you know, in some, you know, some of the commercials, if your wife, postropedic, here go one. Well, if you know, if your wife's snoring or your son or your husband's snoring, she just pushed his head up on her, his side. It don't affect her. And he stopped snoring because he sat up. $5,000 for these beds or more. I got to have it. I don't care if I, my son, I don't fulfill my obligation to my husband, to my son, to my children. Well, I don't care if I fulfill my obligation to my wife and my children. I got to have this money. Brothers and sisters in this land. That stuff come last. Allah is your provider, not you. Allah is your provider. Allah says, In the heavens is your provisions of what you've been promised. We got to wake up. That be our problem. So the sheikh says, again, in these verses is the warning of gathering wealth. And making it abundant, along with the fact lacking and showing gratitude with it. And the abandonment of obedience to Allah and His Messenger because of the sake of wealth. 
Number three, third benefit. في الأوافل آيات أن القبر أول منازل الآخرة وهو روضة من رياض الجنة أو حفرة من حفر النار. أعوذ بالله من ذلك. He said in these verses is that the grave is the first levels to the hereafter. It is either going to be a garden from the gardens of paradise, the grave, your grave site, or it's going to be a hole from the holes of the hellfire, or a pit from the pits of the hellfire. Wafiha, number four, in these verses, al imanu bil ba'thi, having belief in the resurrection, wal jaza'i, and having belief in being recompensed for one's al a'mal upon one's actions and deeds. Number five, وَفِيهَا الْحَثُّ عَلَى مُبَادَرَةِ إِلَى الْأَعْمَالِ الصَّالِحَةِ In this verses is the encouragement and incitement, inciting upon rushing to do righteous acts. Upon rushing to do righteous, righteous acts. This is the encouragement upon rushing to do righteous acts. So this means when you hear that what we've been presenting, y'all deeds should be increasing. You're not here to be entertained. You're in here to be in man increase. And it'll, it'll be, it'll, Iman increases with obedience. So more righteous acts should be apparent on your actions to show you you're benefiting from these classes. Number six. وَفِيهَا الْحَثُّ عَلَى تَرْكِ مَا يَشْغَلُ عَن ذِكِرِ اللَّهِ جَلَّ وَعَلَى عَلَى In this is the encouragement to abandon all that which occupies and busy one from the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jalla. This one is serious here. This one is serious. You ask a person, you looked at the Quran today, brothers and sisters, and you read the book of Allah, you made the morning, evening, dhikr, you say, no. Well, did you make time to watch TV? Yeah, I did. I sure did. The answer's in the pudding. Number seven. Wafil ayat in these verses. At-ta'kidu bi anna al-insana in these verses is the emphasis here that the human being shall see the hellfire on the day of judgment with the eye of certainty. In these verses, number eight, that the human being, he will be debated and argued on the day of judgment. He will be argued, debated, and questioned عن نعم الله about the bounties of Allah. فيجب استعانة بنعم الله على طاعة الله which shows us that it is obligatory to seek assistance with the bounties of Allah upon the obedience of Allah. شكرا لله as a means of gratitude to Allah, the Mighty and the Sublime. That's the point of this surah. We walk away from here. We should have these eight benefits manifesting itself every day we go to before, when we wake up until we go to bed. We should see a difference in ourselves. More righteous acts coming forth from us. Less things to distract us that don't benefit us in this worldly life or in our hereafter. That should decrease now. It's the point of the Quran, brothers and sisters in Islam. And this is the end of our presentation, inshallah ta'ala. Next week. With the help of Allah, we will be entering Surah Al-Asr. Surah Al-Asr, insha'Allah. The surah entitled Time. Or the prayer time of Asr or time period. Are there any questions from what we presented? Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Any questions? Oh, he put your hand. I saw your hand first. Fadla. Okay, good. No, but he had his hand in the back. You had your hand up before him? Yeah. Nobody usually put their hand up before him. Yeah, after him? Yeah, this man got okay, yeah. sonic speed with raising his hand. Oh, you Fuck said bud. something that puzzled me. Fuck bud. Okay, in regards to you saying that when I'm a shake saying that when you reach the highest level of a man, there's maybe times when you're dreaming, you may see a law. I said it's possible. Possible. It's possible. But you know what a law looks like. Yes, he does. We do. We know he from gave his descriptions. We don't know what he looked like. Like it, a lot of say he has hands. When Sali Fauzan Hafidahullah mentioned this, God, the brother asked the question, sisters. He said he's confused about the statement I made about 
um, the is that some of the scholars have mentioned that if your iman is really high, you can be, you can see a law, you can see hellfire, paradise, and things of this nature. He said, "How can you see a law if we don't know what a law looks like?" Okay, my answer was what Sheikh Sali Fawzan said because I'm gonna pass this football to the scholars because I'm just conveying, and that is. Sheikh Salih Fawzan said, this is only possible with seeing Allah is if you know what Allah look like based on knowing his names and attributes. Okay. Based on, of course, do we have a full picture of that? Of course we don't. We're very limited. As Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءَ that, you, that they do not encompass nothing of his knowledge except what he wills. So that's right. limited. Right. Like that. So it's possible... And the point of Sully Fozan saying those who have knows the names and attributes are this same principle applies with seeing the messenger of Allah in the dream. Same principle applies with him. We can see the messenger of Allah in the dream. But you got to know his description, which is very detailed. More, because we only have limited knowledge about Allah. He said, but you have to know that description. Why is Sully Fozan saying this? It's because Shaitan can come to you and say, I'm Allah. No. That's the point I was getting. And Shaitan can come to you and say that I am the prophet and give you new legislation. And you tell them, well, I got new legislation. We got deviant sex that was based off of that. The prophet allegedly came in a dream and gave them these new revelations. That's not happening. I had a dream like that before. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, so, so, you know, these things is based off of knowledge. You know what Allah's ancient attributes are. You know how he works and how he deals with his creation. It's going to be under the yardstick of that. You know, and, and so this is a person that's familiar would have, have knowledge of these affairs better because if you don't shaitan will come and play i'm gonna tell you a nice story and the jinn they play in your dream and in real life and i heard sheikh sali al usaymi tell this story hafizahullah may allah preserve our ulama man he said that he had one of my shaykh that he had learned from had told this story and he was from Baghdad and in the story he said there was a student that stopped coming to the class that would normally come to his classes so he went to check on his student they called tafakkud he went to check on his student to see what's going on so he went to the student house and said why well, haven't seen you in the class what's going on and the sheikh or the student was like, well, you know, I don't have time. I'm doing that time. You know, I have this man who comes, picks me up, and he takes me to Jannah overnight. And then I come back before Fajr. The sheikh said, oh, yeah? You saw the Jannah? He said, yeah, I saw a paradise. He said, you saw a paradise? He said, yes, I saw a paradise. He takes me, this man comes, pick me up, and takes me to paradise. Better close, people. <laughs> So The sheikh said Okay I want to come with you tonight When the man come pick you up So He went with the man To go He stayed with his student Till this man came in late at night And they went to this place And the sheikh saw it It was paradise Gardens underneath, underneath which rivers flow Stuff that he never seen before in his life He was amazed and so, right before Fajr, the man said to them, let's go back. It's time to go back now. The sheikh said, no, I'm not going back. The scholar. He told the man, I'm not going back. He said, why are you not going back? He said, khalas, I'm in general. I ain't going back. I'm here. I'm in bliss. And so the man became angry and left the two of them. And they stayed, so the students stayed with this. The, sh the student stayed with the sheikh in, in, the, in the garden. And then when the dawn came, all of a sudden, all of that was like a mirage. It disappeared, and they realized they was in the garbage dump of Baghdad. And he said to his student, he said, this is the tricks of shaitan, and he comes and plays at night. And I knew Allah would expose him when the dawn came. So brothers and sisters in Islam, Shaitan can come and play these games with us. And nothing can deal with it but knowledge. Knowledge repels doubt and it repels 
desires. It help you put your desires in check. Well, you won't allow it, as Allah is saying here, to distract you away from the obedience of Allah, away from the remembrance of Allah. Tabaraka wa ta'ala. So this is important. And for us, this is super important because we live in a time where we have a lot of distractions from televisions, from our phones, from social media. You know, we have to deal with these things. And it's a challenge. And wallahi, especially the children with the games. We love putting them games in front of these kids. And we destroying our children with that stuff, man. Just letting them play with that stuff freely. Uh, well, last question we're going to... Uh, oh, we had a question. What was your question? Uh, what was your question? Okay. What was your question? My question is that if you committed a, a major sin, let's say, in the past, and you forget about it, you didn't make Toba for it, how do you process in making Toba for that sin? Uh, the brother asks if you committed a major sin in the past and you never made repentance for it, it's an old sin, you're not on it no more, How do you, what's the process you go and remain in repenting for that sin? No, uh, no doubt, brother, kalaw fikum, the process is to repent immediately, ask Allah to forgive you, to feel regret about that sin to of course be an individual who have left that sin and has determined to never return to that sin and if you took the rights of anybody connected to that sin you try to return those rights back if it's possible and and this is how you repent no matter how old the sin or how new the sin is repentance start immediately because the law says Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuha O you who believe Repent to Allah with a sincere repentance. Because truly your Lord will expiate from you your sins. And this is very important for us to understand that reality. So the repentance started immediately with meeting those conditions. Regretting it, never returning to it, determined to never return to it, abandon that sin, and return people rights if somebody rights was abandoned or burned with it and immediately follow that evil deed sin with a good deed which is first repentance and then doing uh, try to do a righteous deed that match that 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 evil deed medical or fecal question from the sister what is the delil that we are able to see a lot in one's dream jazakumallah khayra is the hadith that states it not like that. The proof is it happened to the, the shu'alama used, that it happened to the messenger of Allah, and it happened to many of the righteous people from amongst the sahaba and the salaf. This is our proof. And this is why the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, from the things of prophecy that remains is truthful dreams. Is truthful dreams. But of course, this is a person that's based on knowledge. We have evidence that's dhaniya and evidence that's qata'iya. You have evidence in Islam that are clear cut, and you got evidence that are evidence that indicate and move towards something. And the proof for this, it happened to the Messenger of Allah, as we see in Targhib with Targhib, that Shaykh al-Bani authenticated, that the Messenger of Allah said, I saw Allah, meaning in a dream, upon the most beautiful of images. And Allah placed his fingers on my shoulders. And I could feel the coolness of his fingers. And when he touched me, I saw the secrets of this life in the hereafter. And this is in Targhib or Targhib. And other hadith, other than this, that's authentic in this area. So there's no shadow of a doubt that this happened to the Messenger of Allah. And we are followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, and likewise, the righteous predecessors. Like, for example, the hadith, as an example of people of the righteous, the hadith of the companion Abu uh, uh, tal, uh, anhu. He saw two men who had just died Who they both accepted Islam together And they both fought jihad But one died the year before the other And one died and the next one died the year later And the one when the one died the year later He saw it right after he died He saw the two of them about to enter the gates of paradise And the one who died a year later, entered the gates of paradise before the one a year before. And he went to the Messenger of Allah to interpret that dream. The Messenger of Allah never denied that person seeing paradise. 
So these things is no doubt, and the scholars of Islam are have they they mention this, they have consensus upon this issue. So this this is how that go. But again, you know, we got to learn our deen from the scholars and the students of knowledge, and we will learn these things. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين واقيم الصلاه Stop.